Hello. So in this video, we're looking at Habermann's section 4.4. Uh, so we're revisiting the wave equation. And now with kind of some of the theory and just in general working with Fourier series um, under our belts, now we're in a position to actually construct solutions to, um, to the wave equation that we see here written in kind of one of its uh, formulations. Um, so the goal for this section in this video is to construct solutions to this PDE um, subject to these boundary conditions, right? So, right, physical picture is um, we have a string, it's tied down at two ends, okay? So the kind of position or the height of the string is zero at, those, at both of those ends. At time zero, it has some profile, f of x. Um, as well as at time zero, there's some initial velocity for kind of um, how, how the string is moving at each point. And the geometry that we care about, well, it's just the interval of zero to L. Okay. So the goal for this video is to construct solutions to um, this equation with these boundary conditions and initial conditions. Okay. Um, so strategy we've been using for all of our PDEs as well as separate variables. Let's look for solutions U um, that decompose into a product of a spatial piece and a time piece, okay? Plug in the boundary conditions, um, right? So U at zero comma T and U at L comma T. Um, in terms of the separated solutions, we get these boundary conditions, okay? But if we plug in, right, this form of U kind of in here, what we're gonna end up with is uh, this equality, okay? So we're gonna keep the C squared term with uh, kind of all the time pieces, but otherwise, right, moving things around, we're gonna get one over C squared, one over H, D squared, H, D, T squared, all of that is equal to one over phi d squared phi dx squared, where phi also has these boundary conditions. Okay, so you may recognize that. Oh well, uh, so with this be, uh, yeah. with these boundary conditions, we'd expect if if we're looking at an eigenvalue problem, we'd expect sine terms to appear and lambda to be n pi over l quantity squared. Okay. So to force that eigenvalue uh, problem to appear, what we need to do is, right, so this is just a function of t, this is just a function of x, so they're equal to each other. We're gonna choose a separation constant to look like this, or lambda's positive, okay? Uh, so choosing this, right, we're gonna get the boundary value problem, d squared dx squared of phi is minus lambda phi with these boundary conditions which of course gives us lambda is that. And I should clarify, this is with n greater than or equal to one. Okay, so we know what our eigenvalues are and we also know what the solution functions are. Okay. So with this specific lambda, right, what we can do is go back up here and now look at this um, uh, just ODE, okay? So we don't have boundary conditions that are just for H, so we can't really um, say as much about H in this case as we could with, um, was it the other uh, kind of Laplace's equation and things like that, um, or just in general, you know, the heat equation. but. What we can do here though, is we can get a general form of the solution for H um, and then incorporate the two initial conditions um, and then start to get solutions, okay? Uh, so what happens with H? Well, uh, plugging things back in. And so again, this Lambda right here is exactly that Lambda. Um, but if H takes this form, then just finding the most general solution we can for this ODE, gives um, H of this form, right? 
so it's going to be some linear combination of sine and cosine. And of course, if you take two derivatives of this, um, right, you're going to have, so this right here is root lambda, this here is C. So two of these coming out, we're going to get, right, lambda C squared. Um, and as of right now, we just have these two arbitrary constants that we can't yet specify, okay? But the initial conditions will specify these two constants. Okay. Um, cool. So we have phi and we have H. Uh, one thing to note, of course, is that here, all of our eigenvalues, right, looking back up here, all of these eigenvalues are positive. Okay. So we don't need to worry about, well, what if lambda is equal to zero? Okay. Um, and so this is because of, right, for this problem, this is because we're working with these boundary conditions. Okay. Um, if instead we said something like, oh, well, instead of the uh, displacement of the string is zero, um, maybe the kind of, uh, I'm sorry, we're saying this. The string is kind of clamped to possibly moving you know, things. Okay. Mathematically, if instead of these boundary conditions, we ask for the derivative in X, these derivatives are zero. Well, then the eigenvalue problem that we get here, right, these derivatives, I'll do phi prime, phi prime, those derivatives will be zero. So then uh, phi of X, this will be cosine of n pi over Lx. And then lambda will be n pi over L squared with n greater than or equal to zero. So possibly zero. Um, so if we change the boundary conditions, lambda equals zero is, an, is a possibility. Um, and so down here, we'd have to modify this, right? It would be solving this when lambda is equal to zero and H of T would be what? C1 T plus C2. And that would be another viable uh, solution or viable piece. Um, but in this case, we're just gonna focus on Kind of this this situation with kind of zero boundary conditions. Okay. okay. So our general solution is going to be, well, right, we have these two building blocks, phi depending on n, h depending on n. Um, and so since we were looking for solutions that were products of these two and taking kind of a superposition of these solutions, um, our general solution is going to look like this, right? So just summing up these basic building blocks, um, phi and h. But then if we actually go in, right, multiply phi, which just has a sine term, and multiply that by h, which is a sum of sine and cosine, right? Each of these pieces is going to be a sum of two terms, okay? So one of those terms is going to be, um, well, the sine piece in X is multiplied by the sine piece in T, right? And so notice in particular that this sine piece has a C right there, right? Because it comes from the T, go to E. And then we just have some coefficient right there. Um, as well as a piece that we get from multiplying, right? The sine piece in space, or phi uh, with the cosine piece for time. And again, there's a C there as well as just a T. Um, right, so this is our solution. In a sense, we've decomposed it as a uh, Fourier sine series in X, where it turns out that the T component is also a sum of sine and cosine pieces. Um, but one thing to note is that, right, so our initial conditions up here, right, we're specifying initial conditions both in terms of just the function evaluated at time zero, as well as the time derivative of the function evaluated at time zero, okay? So if we want to solve for a sub n and b sub n, right, the coefficients that are appearing in the series um, decomposition, if we want to solve for those two uh, coefficients, then 
we need to figure out what u and its derivative are in, in terms of these sine um, series, okay? So for our general solution, we also wanna uh, compute what the derivative is, and then we can match, match the coefficients with these given functions. Okay. Um, so this is our solution u. The derivative of our, of our solution in time, right? So take the derivative in time here, distribute it to each side. Um, derivative of sine of C n pi over L t, that's gonna be C n pi over L times cosine of C n pi over L t. Everything else stays the same, right? So here you can see this came out and sine became cosine. Likewise, take the time derivative of this piece, right? The C m pi over L uh, is gonna come out. Derivative of cosine is minus sine. And so we end up with this, okay? So we're just taking the time derivative of each of these pieces for each of the terms in our sum. Okay. Um, so now let's actually incorporate the initial conditions so that we can figure out what B sub n and A sub n are. Um, so what does that give us? Well, if we evaluate, so if you evaluate U at time zero, right? Zero right there, sine of zero, this is zero. Otherwise, cosine of zero, this becomes one. So u at zero, we should only see the a of a sub n sine of n pi over lx. Okay. So that's exactly what we get. But our initial conditions tell us that, well, u at time zero, that's equal to some given function f of x. Okay. Likewise, if we look at the derivative, okay, plug in t is equal to zero. Uh, well, now here, zero there, zero there. This cosine is gonna be one. This sine is gonna be zero, right? So looking at the derivative and plugging in t equals zero, now we're gonna isolate these b sub n, okay? So the derivative at time zero, that's exactly, yeah, b sub n times c n pi over l times sine of n pi over l x. Uh, and we're also given information about what the time derivative is at time zero. That's exactly g of x. Okay. Um, cool. So one thing to note is that, well, right, we're looking at two different kind of uh, Fourier series, right? We're saying this f of x, whatever this is, we're writing it as a Fourier series. Um, likewise, this g of x, whatever it is, right, we're requiring that it's also written as a Fourier series here, except kind of the, the coefficient for sine is b sub n c n pi over l, right? It's not just b sub n, it also has another thing tacked on, but whatever. This is still the coefficient for a sine term, and we're summing up a bunch of signs, okay? So what that suggests is, well, what is this a sub n? This is gonna be, or these are gonna be the uh, coefficients for the odd extension of F uh, to kind of negative L, L, right? Likewise, B sub N times C N pi over L, these are going to be the Fourier coefficients for G of X extended to negative L, L. Um, and so we can write this out explicitly. So A sub N, Take the odd extension of f, compute the Fourier series. It's an odd function, so we're only going to see sine terms. This is what we end up with. Um, but the thing is that, I mean, so you can think of this as two ways. One, ease of computation. Two, technically, the things that we're looking at, the functions that we're looking at, are only defined from zero to l. Okay. Either way you want to look at it, another way to compute these coefficients is um, this equivalent formulation where you just integrate uh, from zero to L of two over L times F of X sine of and pi over L X, okay? Um, 
why are these equal? Number of ways. Quickest way to get this is probably uh, split up this integral into integral from negative L to zero plus integral from zero to L. Okay. Um, F of X is odd. Sine of n pi over LX is odd. And so kind of using those two pieces as well as changing of variables. Um, let's say this. Yeah, so using the fact that this function is also odd. So if you plug in negative X, negative X here, this negative is gonna come out, but because F is odd, this negative is gonna come out. So those negatives are gonna cancel. Otherwise, reparameterize, go from X to minus X so that you pick up a minus DX right there and then a zero or it should be then an L to zero. Flip the bounds of integration. You're gonna pick up a minus sign that cancels with the minus sign that you got from the minus DX there, et cetera. Anyways, you go through the steps, they're equivalent, um, but either of these two formulas will give you the coefficients a sub n. Essentially what we're doing are computing Fourier coefficients for the odd extension of f. Okay. Anyways, yeah. So that's how we use these initial conditions to get the a sub n. We can do the same thing to get uh, these Fourier coefficients b sub n times c n pi over l. This is one way to write them, of course. As I just said, you can also write these as one over L integral from minus L to L, G of X sine of n pi over X or n pi over L X DX. These two integrals are the same. But, okay, so that gives us a way to compute A sub n and B sub n. Okay, and then in practice, right, this is telling us how to get, um, uh, right, match the initial conditions to the general form of our solution that we got using these in the Fourier series. Okay. Yeah. So that's that's our solution. This is our solution to the wave equation with these coefficients. Cool. We solved it. Good job, everyone. Um, okay. So one question then is, well, how can we make sense of these solutions kind of physically, right? I mean, the physical motivation is you have a string tied down, um, perturb it, let it go, or flick it, or something. Um, can we make sense of these right, solutions that we computed in these ways? Can, can we try to match those to what's happening physically? Um, and especially, can we figure out how a sub n and b sub n, how those manifest say, physically? Um, and so one way we can kind of get there is kind of the following, okay? So uh, kind of the building blocks, the phi sub n times h sub n, those take this form, right? Where we saw just a second ago how to compute a sub n and b sub n. Right, but these are the, kind of the basic building blocks for our um, general solution to the wave equation. Okay, um, so it turns out that we can rewrite this expression. Well, in particular, this thing in here, you can write as a sine function. Okay, so what we're doing is we're taking this argument, that's the same right there. Otherwise, we're taking the coefficients a sub n and b sub n combining them in this way, as well as combining them to get this arctan b sub n over a sub n as kind of a shift for the sine function, okay? Um, and so then what we see here is, well, we have a sine term here, a sine term here, right? Maximum of sine is one, okay? So what is the magnitude? of each of these building blocks, well, it's just gonna be whatever this number is, right? So the square root of a sub n squared plus b sub n squared, right? That is the magnitude of 
say the nth building block, you may say. Okay. Um, and so kind of what I just said in words is right there. Question you might have is, well, why is this thing right here equal to this thing right there? Um, one way to get that is, well, the uh, angle addition formula for sine, okay, sine of A plus B, sine of A times cosine of B plus cosine of A times sine of B. Um, and then, right, cosine of arc tan BN over AN, draw a triangle, this angle theta, this is exactly arc tan of B sub N over A sub N, um, right, tangent is opposite over hypotenuse, so opposite B sub N, this is there. Maybe technically, if you want to be super careful with this, you might want absolute values there. Um, that doesn't really matter. Anyways, cosine of arctan of that is this. Sine of arctan of that is that. Um, take this thing, plug in whatever, you're going to end up with this. Okay, so maybe it doesn't give any intuition as to why we'd go from, or how we can go from this to this, but this does give verification and proof that, that uh, these are the same. Okay? But the point of all of this is that, um, right, so for each of these building block pieces and our separated solution and then superposition, kind of the magnitude or the strength of that term is gonna be this square root of a sub n squared plus b sub n squared. Okay? Um, And so you'd expect that these are going to go to zero as you kind of add more and more terms because right, your, your signal or your string kind of right when it's vibrating, you're only really going to see the kind of you know lowest frequency or the most dominant pieces. But anyways, so that's just one one of the aspects for these um, solutions, kind of the the magnitude of each of the building blocks. Um, Few other pieces we can talk about. Well, the frequency kind of, of oscillation in time. And right, keep in mind that, right, how is the solution moving in time while well, it's oscillating, right? Because the time piece had both cosine and sine. Um, we say that the frequency is this term C n pi over L. Um, and kind of in general, the natural frequencies for an oscillating or a vibrating string are going to be. These values for n equals one, two, et cetera, okay? So the frequencies aren't exactly the eigenvalues that we computed from the eigenvalue problem, um, but they're related. And they're related in a way that incorporates kind of the physical properties of, of the material that's vibrating, okay? <clears throat> but anyway, so frequency of kind of time oscillation, cm pi over L, natural frequencies are what we get, plugging in n equals one, two, three, et cetera. Um, and so one question is, well, how do we change kind of the frequency? How do we change how fast it takes for the string to kind of vibrate and complete one oscillation? Okay. Uh, so two ways, let me zoom out a little so we can see the frequencies. So two ways we can modify, modify frequencies um, kind of relatively you know, directly. So the first is, well, just change the length of um, of the string and the interval that we care about, okay? So as L gets larger and larger and larger, right? We'd expect that kind of if you uh, flick or perturb or whatever, right? The string's gonna oscillate more slowly, right? For a longer thing. Whereas if you have a really short string, you flick it, it's going to oscillate and vibrate really quickly. Okay. So as L increases, right, as this, say, gets larger and larger, this whole thing is going to get smaller and smaller. So for large L, we have a smaller frequency. Um, for small L, we have a larger frequency. Okay. And so that maybe should start to match up with. Um, Maybe some of your intuition about, you know, if you vibrate a string, kind of what you hear 
as the out point, right? Higher frequencies um, tend to, for us, register as kind of a higher pitch. Um, lower frequencies are a lower pitch. Okay. Um, yeah, anyways, okay. So kind of that's one way to modify these frequencies and get smaller or larger um, frequencies. Another way to modify you know, these frequencies is well, we can modify C. Okay, this, this constant that depends on these physical properties. Um, so if you recall C, this was the square root of T zero, which was the tension in the string and kind of how much force, you know, if you look at a little portion of the string, how much force that portion of the string feels on each side, that's the tension and how tight the string is. Um, and we also had this rho naught, which was um, the density of the string, which you could think of as um, roughly kind of the weight or the mass. Of the, I mean, right, it's density, so it's not exactly mass, but they're related, directly related. Um, right, so if you increase the tension as T0 gets larger and larger, right, C is going to get larger and larger. So let me write it like this. Um, T0 increases means um, higher frequency. Right. right, so if you play any stringed instrument, right, if you want to get a higher pitch, tighten one of the knobs, it's going to increase the tension. Um, and here we see that, right, increasing the tension means that these natural frequencies are going to increase, which means we'll hear a higher pitch. Likewise, if you increase the density, okay, so if you increase the density, right, in practice, what does this mean? Well, you know, for a uniform volume of string, increase the density, you're increasing the mass in the end, right? And, um, so in practice, what does this mean? Well, if you have a heavier string, Okay, so increase the density, you're going to get a heavier string. You're going to end up with the lower frequency you know, that you hear, which again should match intuition, right? Thin, light string, high frequency, um, heavier string, lower frequency. But anyways, if you play, if you've played guitar, seen bass guitars, things like that, that's kind of a natural example. Um, cellos, violins, and that family of stringed instruments, they'll also match this intuition. Um, if you don't have experience playing with stringed instruments, you, I don't know, take a string like a charging cable and then just try vibrant, I don't know. You can, you can find real world examples of all of this in a not too bad way. Okay. Um, Okay, so as we kind of got up before, right? So these building blocks, these are kind of important um, right, because they, they build up your solution, right? Take a linear combination of them, you're good to go. Um, and so sometimes these might be called like the normal modes, something like that. Um, but kind of in practice or physically the piece that manifests or we might you might be more you know, familiar or have heard about or whatever are these things called standing waves okay um and so in practice standing waves are just the motions that are generated by kind of each of these building blocks or these normal modes um so as an example if you set n equals one right you're kind of you're, you're getting the most basic sine wave you can Okay, at least in space. And then what we're going to do is we're going to let T kind of increase, just let T run. Okay. And so what's going to happen is, well, if you take any point on the interval, as T increases, what's going to happen is kind of the, the string is going to go up and it's going to go down and it's going to go up and then back down, et cetera. Okay. 
but the magnitude of where the string is in time, this is going to be um, kind of the maximum magnitude is going to be a sub n squared plus b sub n squared um, sine of n pi over L x. Okay. So maybe about like halfway through, you're going to get the maximum displacement you can get towards the ends. You're going to get less displacement. Okay. Um, but these standing waves are these motions that are created by each of these normal modes. Okay. So for n equals one, you're going to get sine up top. It's going to decrease and you're going to get kind of sine on the bottom and then increase sine up top, something like that. We could look at the second one. Okay. You're going to get kind of right. This profile that's going to, oh boy, it's going to be like, that was a good way of doing this. So it's like up here and then zero, then down. Whereas over here, it's now up. So it's just going to like oscillate like this. Where my, where my fingers are, that's the center or that's the point L over two. Okay. So this would be the second standing wave or the kind of uh, standing wave for the second normal mode or something like that okay um cool and so one thing you might notice i mean sure we don't have much data but um for n equals one kind of at the ends of this uh standing wave how many zeros are there well there are no zeros okay so we have one minus one zeros over here for kind of the extreme points of the standing wave, how many zeros are there? We just have the one zero, and that's always a zero as well. And so you might think, well, in general, for a sine, do we get n minus one zeros? And the answer is yes. You will always get n minus one zeros uh, for these normal modes, which is an interesting problem, and a whole lot more can be said about that, but we won't say much about that here. Okay. Um, so the final note uh, is kind of this interesting observation about kind of the form that some of these, uh, that, that solutions to the wave equation tend to take. Okay. So if we go back up, right, so our, our normal modes are these building blocks, right, we're a linear combination of sine and sine and then sine and cosine. So what we're going to do next is we're just going to look at one of these pieces, the sine and sine, but you, you'll, you get the exact same sort of profile if you look at sine and cosine. Okay. So what we're going to do is we're going to write this product, right, sine of n pi over Lx, sine of n pi C over L times T. Um, we're going to write it as a sum of two terms. So we're going to get uh, one half cosine of the difference of these two minus one half cosine of the sum of these two. Okay. And so this is a general trigonometric identity. Um, but the point here is, right, each of these building blocks, we can write as a sum of a function that really only depends on x minus ct and a function that only depends on x plus ct. So to highlight that, we're going to write this as right sine of m pi over l x sine of m pi c t over l. That's going to be the sum of some function of x minus c t plus some other function of x plus c t. And so in this case, we can write so r of theta. This is what one half cosine of n pi over l theta, and then the other function of interest, oops, this is s of theta is minus one half uh, cosine n pi over l theta. Oh. Anyways, 
The point here is that you can write as a sum of functions where they only depend on x minus ct and x plus ct, or in general. Um, so these, let me change color. Only depend on x plus or minus ct. So it turns out that that's a general property of um, solutions for at least this wave equation, right? Um, kind of the profiles stay constant and they're just gonna depend on X plus or minus CT. You can also think of them as profile is gonna stay the same. They're just gonna get shifted, okay? At what rate? Well, at this rate. Um, and again, as I said, this is just a general property of solutions to the wave equation. Um, and some of the homework problems have you kind of working this out in detail but for some special cases. Cool. We have solved the wave equation.